The most prominent critic of urbanism and defender of suburban sprawl is probably Randall O'Toole, who calls himself the anti-planner. He argues for private automobiles over public transit, and for low-density single-family housing, enforced by suburban-style zoning that bans or restricts higher densities of housing. When we started writing this video, his most recent article was Densification was a Communist Plot, which opens by explaining that the Soviet Union favored apartment blocks because they would be easier to bomb if anyone tried to revolt. He then denounces the urban planners and libertarian think tanks like Cato and Mercatus that support making California denser. California is already dense enough, he says, and it has no need for higher density, which would just make it vulnerable to attack. The people supporting these laws either have no understanding of history or are deliberately trying to make America more vulnerable to its enemies, or at least easier to control from the top down. Randall O'Toole is an eccentric and inflammatory character, and it's not always clear whether he's serious or trolling. In another post, he says, The fight for free transit is about keeping poor people oppressed. But he is legitimately the most well-known figure who takes urbanist beliefs about housing and transportation and argues for the exact opposite. An urban sprawl is one of those made-up problems. And so we think it's important to cut through and try to engage with his more relevant ideas. The Soviet references make more sense if you assume he's trying to counter people who say that low-density zoning is tarnished by its origins in explicit class and ethnic exclusion, by responding that dense housing has nefarious origins too. The Soviets wanted to bomb their own people. The problem is that social exclusion is not just a random historical fact about single-family zoning. It's an ongoing effect. Banning multiplexes and apartments in high-demand areas literally means that lots of people, especially less wealthy people, are unable to live there. This consequence isn't entirely unintended, either. Exclusion is explicitly stated as a motivation pretty often. People actually comment on our videos explaining how they don't want multifamily housing near their beautiful middle-to-upper-middle-class single-family neighborhood, or explaining how zoning reform would change the demographics of their neighborhood to allow low-rent Democrat voting minorities. To address his less relevant points, Soviet apartment blocks were an efficient way to house people after the devastation of the war, and his 177-page source doesn't mention the Soviets planning to bomb their own cities. If we are seriously basing urban planning around North America getting bombed, which probably means nuked, then we shouldn't live in capital cities or near military bases. Goodbye, San Diego. And being rural is going to help much more than being in the suburbs of a city, especially if you work downtown. A nuclear strike in the U.S. would come with only 20 to 30 minutes of warning. And if you thought traffic was bad after a sports event... His more serious points come up very often in urbanism debates, namely that urban planners and think tanks are forcing density onto cities, and that people just don't want to live in denser housing. He writes against laws like California's SB9, which would allow duplexes and fourplexes on lots formerly limited to single-family homes. A major problem in the density debate is that critics of zoning reform, like O'Toole, often muddle the distinction between allowing density and forcing it. He describes SB9, which again, legalizes duplexes and fourplexes, as forcing Americans to live in higher densities. This is especially weird from people like O'Toole who are critical of urban growth boundaries as government overreach, a topic we'll get to later. But somehow, they don't see the government overreach in micromanaging small differences in what kind of housing you're allowed to live in, like a single-family or multifamily building. He gives a nod to the ideas of freedom and choice by saying that people should be able to live in denser apartments if they want to. But as we all know, policies like single-family zoning make these units difficult to actually build. The idea that people just don't want to live in denser housing is something we've addressed before. Obviously, people value space and privacy. But exactly how much they want and how they balance those preferences with other needs and preferences varies a lot. We could all maximize space and privacy by living in remote rural areas far from any city. But most of us don't do that. Even if you live in a detached home in a suburb, you probably live on a smaller lot with a smaller house than you'd have if you lived in the countryside. You made a trade-off, probably because you actually wanted to be close to an urban area for all the benefits and services it offers. Along those lines... Multiplexes and apartments make sense for many people based on their budgets, space needs, and location preferences. The idea that people just don't want to live in denser housing is a complete red herring, because you wouldn't have to ban denser housing if nobody was going to live in it anyway. Developers would realize how hard it is to sell or rent those units, and they'd stop building them. The simple truth is that these density restrictions come mainly from people who don't want their neighbors to live in denser housing. He goes into a broader defense of single-family zoning in another article, 
How Cato Sold Out California Property Owners, written to call out the Libertarian Cato Institute for supporting zoning reform, and also for firing him. He explains how, in the 1800s, American cities had low rates of homeownership because people didn't want to invest in a home only to see its value destroyed by the introduction of incompatible uses next door or nearby. They fixed this first by deed restrictions and later by zoning. Americans responded by massively increasing homeownership. This led to a golden economic age of low inequality in the 1960s. Homeownership was accessible to almost anyone with a job, and people who owned their own homes were able to use the equity in their homes to start small businesses, put their children through college, or fund their retirement. Urban planners, unhappy with Americans' preference for low-density living, started in the 1970s trying to limit sprawl through urban growth limits which stopped farmers and other landowners from developing housing on agricultural or rural land surrounding cities. He sees these policies as an extreme injustice, the greatest taking of private property since the communist Chinese collectivization of farms in 1953. He cites an article referring to urban growth boundaries as new feudalism because, while they allow people to own land, they effectively transferred the development rights to that land to the government. Why do planners think they have the right to tell private property owners what they can do? Well, planners think that property rights evolve. In other words, if you own a chunk of land and your neighbors think, gee, that land makes a beautiful scenic view shed for our picture windows, let's not develop it, then you get your right to develop it stripped away from you because they're in the majority. And their desire for conservation, scenic vistas, trumps your private property rights. And this is essentially the law of the land in California and Oregon and Florida and, and other states that have adopted these planning rules. They have what they call public involvement. Limits on sprawl, not limits on density, are the real threat to housing affordability, he argues. It's still confusing seeing someone really come out swinging against urban growth boundaries, saying you don't even own property if the almost communist government can take away your right to build housing, but then apparently see no problem in the government telling homeowners that they can only have a single-family home, no duplexes or fourplexes allowed. His argument for zoning because it encourages homeownership is interesting, but not all zoning is created equal. Restricting factories is sensible. Restricting multiplexes borders on absurd. There's also a glaring conflict in how he talks about the effects of single-family zoning. He insists that it's not bad for affordability. Abolishing single-family zoning won't make housing more affordable, he says. But his argument for single-family zoning is that it makes housing a more attractive investment that won't lose value. Presumably this means it will increase in price too, because that's what we expect from investments. And that's the only way housing could compete with stocks as a way to fund your retirement. You know, I, uh, I've been thinking about investing for some time now. This conflicts with affordability. One generation's good investment is the next generation's crushing housing costs. Maybe he gets around this by saying that each generation can find their affordable housing in increasingly distant suburbs and exurbs. But people don't just want a home anywhere. If that was the case, we would all move to rural areas. Most people want to live close to jobs, family, friends, public transit, and other amenities. He stresses that single-family homes are more affordable than denser housing because they have lower construction costs per square foot. Based on Canadian construction cost data, this is really an issue for tall buildings. Ground-oriented density like townhouses can be just as cheap, or even cheaper to build than detached homes, while also saving on land costs. Low-rise density is probably peak affordability under ideal conditions. And the fact that most Canadian and American cities don't allow it by default is an insult to affordability. With that said, tall buildings do make sense in high-demand areas to provide more supply and spread out land costs and other fixed expenses. Finally, one barrier to affordable single-family homes is that the same exclusionary instincts that lead to municipalities banning or restricting multifamily housing also leads to banning or restricting smaller, more modest, detached homes. Four-fifths of all cities in the U.S. have minimum lot size requirements, many as high as one acre, and this matters. We can see very clearly in Vancouver that the affordability of detached homes depends on how densely they're allowed to be built. If we're serious about affordability, then we shouldn't have zoning rules against modest detached homes either. He also points out a correlation where denser cities tend to be more expensive. The problem is that density is partly a response to high demand and affordability pressures. Maybe a single-family home in Tulsa, Oklahoma is cheaper than an apartment in New York, but it doesn't mean that New York can become more affordable by banning or demolishing apartments in favor of single-family homes. 
If you look within each city, it's usually the case that denser housing is more affordable. A detached home in Toronto averages 1.7 million, a semi-detached 1.3 million, a townhouse 1.2 million, and a condo 800,000. Townhouses and condos are clearly more attainable. The same pattern applies in the U.S., although the data isn't fine-grained. Condominiums are cheaper than detached houses in 18 of the 20 biggest metropolitan areas. The two exceptions are Detroit and Atlanta, but everywhere else, including Boston, Seattle, Los Angeles, Dallas, Houston, and Chicago, detached homes are more expensive. Another argument O'Toole and others make is that zoning reform betrays potential home buyers who want a single-family home but won't have as many options if some lots are used for multiplexes or apartments instead. But single-family homes really just don't house very many people, so you are prioritizing one family over four in the case of a fourplex, or many more in the case of an apartment building. This is not to say that every lot in every city needs to house as many people as possible, but when demand exists for land to be used more efficiently, it shouldn't be up to planners, or anti-planners, to prop up low-density housing through strict zoning. Randall O'Toole is actually right about one thing, though. Green belts or urban growth boundaries can make housing less affordable, and it's hard to be entirely comfortable with them if you take a philosophy of housing abundance. We're sympathetic to the environmental motivations, but we have to be careful when they don't actually make demand for land go away. Often leapfrog development just continues on the other side of the green belt, and people have longer commutes, or they're pushed to other cities to develop land there instead. California's limits on housing, both growth boundaries and zoning limits on density, actually increased carbon emissions when they pushed people to move to more affordable cities in a place like Texas, whose more extreme climate requires more energy to heat or cool buildings. However, in what universe would the solution to urban growth boundaries be opening up the land to a monoculture of single-family homes in car-dependent sprawl? You miss an opportunity to develop good urbanism outside of the influence of NIMBYs. You burn through land so much faster, and you negate some of the housing affordability gains with big transportation costs. Urban expansion should mean allowing a range of housing types to meet people's different needs, preferences, and incomes, and it should not be built entirely around cars. Maybe car-dependent areas that only meet some people's needs feel like freedom to those people, but it's not freedom for everyone. It's a basic failure of infrastructure and government services, like failing to provide libraries, schools, or a fire department. Building entirely around cars also limits your growth in the future. O'Toole keeps coming back to the idea that California is already dense enough, and one article he links refers to duplexes and fourplexes as a radical density experiment, but the densities we're haggling over, especially with SB9, are pretty modest. Cities all around the world handle these densities with ease, It's only when you put everyone into a car, truck, or SUV to get anywhere that even modest densities feel threatening and crowded. One final point is that O'Toole's core argument for single-family zoning is that it makes housing an attractive investment and encourages home ownership. Owning a home offers many benefits, including long-term stability and a sense of permanency and control that many people enjoy. And those are reasons why home ownership should be accessible and affordable. But we don't think it makes sense to try to push people into homeownership with additional incentives like rising prices. A better world to us is not one where housing is a great investment opportunity that encourages people to buy in and punishes renters. It's one where housing is stable and affordable, and you can be comfortable buying or renting. If you want to stay open to job opportunities in multiple cities, for example, you should probably be renting. And you shouldn't feel pressured into buying before you're ready because you're worried about getting priced out. Thanks for watching through to the end of the video. Randall O'Toole has written a lot, and we're barely scratching the surface here. He also talks about transportation and, brace for it, environmentalism too. While his inflammatory style distracts from his ideas, and his frequent references to communism don't feel as relevant now as they might have 50 or 60 years ago, he's essentially a compilation of all the typical arguments against urbanism that we come across, and so he's a useful way to address many of them in one place. As always, a special thanks to our supporters on Patreon. 